thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here. It's my third visit to KAIST. The last one was about 20 years ago, and the place doesn't look like it did then. But my first one, as young June mentioned, was in 1991, <laughs> before many of you were born. <laughs> and I can tell you, there's nothing left here except a little bit of tile work that reminds me of what it was like at that time. Now, I'm going to talk about, um, you see the title, the sequence of events is going to be, I'm going to start out with some problems. So these are going to be not mathematical problems, they're just problems in the real world. Things we, we think we need to understand better for one reason or another. And then I'll forget about the problems and I'll talk about water waves. That's just theory that goes back into the 19th century. And we'll review the 19th century and up to more or less modern times. And then we'll go back to the problems. But we go back armed with water wave theory. And the water wave theory is, will give us some ideas about these problems. Some of these ideas uh, can, could be actually already are very useful, as you'll see. OK, so let's see if I can make this work. OK, so I want to give some credit. Um, the work that I'm going to discuss, I'm not going to talk individually about who did what, but I want you to understand that there are oceanographers, um, coastal engineers, numerical analysts, pure mathematicians, applied mathematicians, physicists, all involved in this work. Okay, and it's, a, it, it's work that spans some maybe 20 years or something like that. Okay, so let's start off with the problems. Okay, so I want to talk off about rogue waves. So you, they also call, call giant waves or freak waves. You can, if you go back two or 300 years, you will see accounts of sailors talking about waves that were 100 feet high that attacked their ship. And nobody believed them. I mean, that's like saying, I caught a fish like that. <laughs> but OK, now we have cameras and things like that, so they become more believable. So what is a rogue wave? Do not think tsunami. We'll talk about those later. A rogue wave is a wave that appears in space and time locally. So it, it exists for a while in time and in space. It's localized. And then it disappears. It's gone. That's a rogue wave. So let me, sh we don't, you could stand in a piece of the ocean for your whole life and you wouldn't see a rogue wave. I mean, you, you just have to be lucky or unlucky. <laughs> so this is the North Sea. This is the north part of the North Sea. And if you look in the background, you can see that this is not a rough sea. Actually, it's a pretty calm sea for the North Sea in that part of the, the, of the water. But here you see a rogue wave forming and coming, coming on board. So the poor guy who's taking the pictures has no place to run. So he just takes pictures. So here it comes. I mean, that's a, that's a pretty large wave. Of course, we have no way of measuring it. But the estimate is 150 feet or something like that, 50 meters, that sort of, that sort of size. This is a, a boat going into the trough of a rogue wave. It's a different one. It's not the one you just saw. Now, boats are built to withstand pressure. They're, they're very strong. In the, but they're not built to take this kind of flex. And that's what happens when, when you... You get a boat going into, the, into a trough like that. Uh, this, by the way, is a, a shallow water. Those were deep water roadways. This is a shallow water rogue wave. They're possibly different. We'll talk about it. OK, now here's our only field data. This is January 1st, 1950, 1995. 
And it's a pretty rough, it, this is a, a Norwegian oil platform, and it's pretty rough seas, five, 10 meter waves. But all of a sudden, here's this one. And that, it looks like it's 30 meters, but in fact, it's probably much bigger than that. The instruments that just happened to be in the water um, saturated before probably you, you saw the, so it's probably more like a 50 meter wave, and then it's gone. Right, you went back to the, to the ambient sea and you didn't see another one. So that, that's one of the few bits of field information we have about rogue waves. Rogue waves are dangerous. Yes, this is what they can do. So as I told you a minute ago, boats are not built to take this kind of flexing. They're, they're not, they're not, nobody expects them to have to. That was an aircraft carrier. Um, one rogue wave <laughs> destroyed it. And there's an oil platform that didn't do too well either. Okay, so the question is, where do they come from? Where, 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 you have a sea which is reasonably calm, and then all of a sudden you have this 50 meter wave. Where did that come from? Okay, so there's, there are some ideas. One idea which I call concurrence is the following. So I look out at the, at the ocean and I see waves everywhere. And there's a lot of energy out there. It's all spread out. But maybe if you're <laughs> lucky or unlucky, those waves all get together for a little while and have a party. And when they have a party, <laughs> you get big waves. All right, that's one possibility. Another possibility is Actually, this doesn't show up. Uh, there's a statistical theory of wave amplitude. What does that say? Roughly speaking, that says the following. It says, so if you look at wave amplitude, you, you have a distribution, something like a Rayleigh distribution. And out here are the big waves. But that doesn't tell you why there's any waves out here. So I don't view that as a very helpful idea. Another idea is wave current interaction. That's a better idea. So this is, this is a situation that happens sometimes off the coast of Africa, where you have a current running maybe half a kilometer down, and you have wind coming the other way. Uh, and a, you know, a fetch of wind, maybe two or three days worth. Then you can get big waves. Actually, you see these sometimes on rivers. When you, a river has a definite flow, and sometimes the wind is coming against that flow, and then you will see interesting waves. Okay, and then, there, of course, there's also topographical forcing. That would be when the wave can feel the bottom. That would not be deep water waves. Deep water waves, they don't know the bottom is down there. Uh, but shallow water waves, you could have some of this. I tend to not give that much credit because maybe 20 years ago, uh, Norwegian folks tr decided to try to get energy out of waves. People have been trying to do that for many decades, unsuccessfully so far. Um, they tried to build a situation where they would focus the waves, and then the, they have a big enough waves which are um, current that they can get energy out of those waves. It, it failed. That, that was another one, one of the many experiments that failed. Okay, so that's rogue waves. We want to know where they came from. We'll come back to that. Oh, that's a fiber optics cable. That's, you know, light runs down those cables. So these cables are actually rather complicated. Let me show you. This is, this is what they look like. And the part that actually transmits signals is down here. This is glass. There are rogue waves here too as it turns out. This was, was a surprise. So how does fiber optics cable work? It's not just any old piece of glass, it's a piece of glass that doesn't let light out. So you, if I had a coil of fiber optics cable and I shone a light in one end of it, if you could see the coil, I've turned the lights off, if you could see the coil, it's not a very good fiber optics cable. The light is not supposed to get out until it gets to the end. Okay. Okay, so there was some French 
um, scientists making some experiments. And um, I, I won't go into what they were doing. It's actually rather interesting, but I won't go into it. But what they found was a more or less constant background spectrum. And then all of a sudden, this peak. And again, the situation is probably much bigger than that because the instruments were not capable of measuring anything much bigger than what you see. So that's a, a rogue wave. Okay. Uh, that one very likely we can explain. Okay, now let's talk about tsunamis. Tsunamis are not like rogue waves. Tsunamis propagate across thousands of kilometers of ocean. They're, 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 they're not localized in space or time. They're, they tend to be big, broad things. Let's look at some tsunamis. Okay, so here's one. It's Hawaii, 1946. Um, not a very big tsunami coming on board. Uh, the guy should be running, by the way, <laughs> not, not standing there in front of the wave. You'll see another example of this in a minute. Okay, this is, this is this recent one near Sendai, coast of Japan, and there you see the tsunami. You have no idea how big that thing is because you don't have a vertical scale. Right? You can't tell if it's a five feet tall or 100 feet tall. Okay, but now you begin to get a vertical scale and you see what this tsunami was doing. Okay, it caused a lot of damage. So the epicenter was out here in the Pacific, and Sendai was the closest place, and that got the majority of the damage. Okay, but I want to focus on a different tsunami. This is a very interesting one. This is much earlier. So that's the south coast of um, what? Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka, the island south of India. Okay, so you're up in a plane, so you, you're, not, you're not worried about being in trouble with the tsunami. And a wave comes, the, the first wave comes on board, and you missed it because you weren't paying attention. You were just taking pictures. So there it is. It, a, big, a big wave has flooded the area. And now the next picture is ex extremely interesting. So this is right after the first wave came on. And you see the water running out like you pulled a plug in your bathtub. So if you're ever at a beach and you begin to see the water going out like that, go the other way. <laughs> because that water is, that mass is forming a wave. And that wave is coming your way. So let's. Here, here the second wave has, has come on board, and this time they caught it. This is, this is uh, Thailand. That, that's the same tsunami that was hitting, hitting Sri Lanka. And um, you see it coming on board here. And by the way, everybody's doing the right thing except the American tourist who's sitting there staring at the wave. Okay, this is a very interesting sequence of, of pictures. So this is also Thailand, but it's a different beach. The water has run out, as I showed you in that picture um, um, in Sri Lanka. And people are, you know, wandering, looking, at, looking for shells and so forth that they can't normally get to because the water's too high. And there you see the, the wave forming. Okay, now let's go back a minute. These, this wave was generated by earthquake. And what the earthquake did is it moved the bottom about that much. OK, it was a lot of water because it was a <laughs> large earthquake. But it only moved the bottom like that. So water is more or less incompressible. So more or less immediately on the surface, there's a huge heap of water that high. That doesn't sound very dangerous. OK, but it's, the water is not going to, that hump of water is not going to sit there. It will propagate. Gravity is at work. So it starts to propagate, and it runs across the ocean, actually order of 700 miles an hour. But if you were in a boat, 
in the middle of the ocean, you probably wouldn't notice it. I mean, it's only this high. And it's very long. So it'll be very slowly you'll be lifted up. You might not notice it, probably not, out in the deep water. However, when it gets near the shore, uh, it feels the bottom much more strongly than it did out in the deep water. That shortens the wavelength. That mass has to go somewhere. <laughs> it goes up. And you see the wave becoming visible to the naked eye. It was, in the middle of the ocean, it wasn't visible. And OK, so we're going to follow this wave in. You, you, you can't tell how big it is because, again, no vertical scale. Well, it looks like it might be pretty big. OK, now you have a vertical scale. That's a person. OK, the, the camera, of course, did not survive this wave, but the chip did. That's where we got these pictures. OK, so now what's the question about tsunamis? I'm talking about this one we were just discussing. Uh, it was, the epicenter is here by Indonesia. Of course, Indonesia got, the, got, got smashed. The, color, the countries that are colored in yellow are the ones that had serious damage. And my definition of serious damage is somebody died. So the question is, how do you, one question is, how do you get energy across thousands of kilometers of the Indian Ocean and kill somebody in South Africa? I mean, how, how, why doesn't the wave just spread out? And um, by the time it gets over here, there should be nothing left. OK, that's the first question. Second question, a little more detailed. OK, so these are estimated death tolls. Indonesia, of course, got the worst. Um, I want to call your attention to Sri Lanka and Thailand, because they're both about the same distance from the epicenter. And OK, and there's a factor of four difference in their death totals. Why? What's going on? OK. So I would like to be able to explain why, these, why this big difference. And that actually might be important, because it might have something to do with, with the way you organized your coast and your coastal defenses against such things. OK, I think. I'm going to, OK, these are internal waves, these are waves underneath the ocean. So you may not even know such things exist, but they do. The reason they exist is because the ocean is not homogeneous. If the ocean was homogeneous, you wouldn't have any waves underneath. But it's not homogeneous. On, on the top, it's hot and salty. And on the bottom, it's cold and fresh. Now, if you jump into the Pacific Ocean in the middle, you may not feel hot. But if you go down two or three miles, you will feel that that was hot up there. So these, these are internal waves. They're taken from satellite um, using a, a type of radar. The, the color is artificial, it's just, just to show the waves. So these are, these are huge waves. They're not anything small. Um, there's an example of some. Those are clouds. This is, here's, this is the east coast of the United States. Some internal waves coming onto the, um, the, the continental shelf. <clears throat> and you see the size of them. They're order of 50 meters high. And their wavelength has a frequency of five minutes. So these are, these are huge waves. And they, they do things that we'll, we may get time to talk about. OK. This is just for fun. Um, these are also waves generated that are more or less in the same modeling region that we're going to be talking about. This is on a river. And this is what's called a bore. So what happens is that in the spring and the fall, when the tides are high, you, you get in a bay. If you've got a bay that's shaped correctly leading into a river, you will get a surge of water coming up the river. That sorts itself out into these undular regions. And it's on bores that the surfing records are set for length. Not out in the ocean. Don't think of Hawaii. River bores. You can go miles on these things. OK, I haven't tried. 
Okay, another, another problem. This one's actually pretty important. Sandbars. So you know what a sandbar is. You're at the beach. You walk out, it gets deep, and then it gets more shallow. You're walking over a sandbar. All right, so let's look at some sandbars. Here's, okay, this is Madeline Island. I'll show you where it is in a minute. Okay, you can't make out the third bar, unfortunately, in this. But there's a bar here and a bar here where the waves are breaking, and actually that's important. We'll come back to it. This is 10 miles down the coast, and the same bars, the same bar sequence, as I say, you can't see the third one, um, has nice linear bars that run down the coast. Okay, here's more. This is Victoria, uh, Australia. And again, you can see, now you can more or less make out three bars. There are, in fact, five. But the two deep ones you can't see this way. You have to go out and measure. Okay, so I'm going to run down the coast about 25 miles. And I watch these bars. There's nice linear bars that go for miles and miles and miles. Okay, store that. This is Madeline Island. It's in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. Actually, the commercial airlines go, fly there. <laughs> Goodness knows why anybody lives there. But it's a great place for sandbars and birds. Okay, so here, this, what I'm showing you here is again Madeline Island, but this is actual bathymetry. This, this is, a, is a measurement of one cross section of the bars, and here's what, what's out there. So there, there is a fundamental question. Where'd they come from? And how, how do they maintain themselves? Because they seem to maintain themselves over periods of months, years, and so forth. Okay, so we'll deal with that. Okay, finally, blood flow. Okay, again, what does that have to do with waterways? You'll see. Um, so let's see, remember how blood works. You, you got a heart with four, four, four chambers. The right side is a low pressure situation. That it pumps the blood through the lungs. And you get oxygen into your blood and gets to the left side and the left side runs the blood all around your body and you stay alive. Okay, so this is, this is I'm only talking about the arterial system. I'm not talking about the, the system after it goes through the tiny uh, vessels. That actually is a much simpler system. Uh, so this is, this is the, the major parts of the arterial system. And here's a mathematician's version <laughs> of that. <laughs> okay, so it's a little idealized. As I say, we, we, we're thinking about this, this all the way down to the capillaries, but not past. Because what happens on the other side of the cap, cap blood going through capillaries is at very low pressure. I mean, really low pressure. If you, I haven't seen blood in a human going through a capillary, but I have seen them through frogs. And some of the capillaries are very fussy. They let one cell through at a time. So really low pressure. All right. So we know about blood disease, right? This is the standard kind of thing that we worry about. This is when your, your arteries get clogged up with uh, plaque and calcified and so forth. And um, after a while, you, you you don't do too well. Okay, so that's, that's every, everybody knows about this. But what you may not know about is that there's also problems over here in this part where you're pumping blood through the lungs. So that is not a high pressure situation. It's relatively low pressure. But there's, there's a, a, a disease called pulmonary hypertension Actually, lots of people have pulmonary hypertension. I didn't know about this until I got into this work. Um, those arteries clog up too, but it's not because of calcium or something like that, not plaque. We don't understand what happens here. Uh, this is something that's under investigation right now. But as these arteries close up, what happens? Our, our bodies actually are amazing machines. Um, they, the body knows that 
it's not getting enough uh, oxygen. So the heart pumps harder to get more blood through the, through the lungs. What happens is the, as the heart pumps harder is that it gets bigger. The heart itself gets bigger. The walls get thin, of course, because you know, you've only got so much mass there. And what kills you is not the blood flow, it's the heart. Eventually it breaks because it, the wall gets too thin. So we, we would like to understand this, and I will, okay, I'm, I'm not gonna explain that right now. Okay, now, forget, those are problems. There are half a dozen more I could trot out, but then I'd take the whole lecture. So let's talk about water wave models. Okay, so here's, a, here, I, this is idealized at the moment. I have a flat ocean, and I have an undisturbed depth H naught. Okay, so it's flat, it's, it's all of R3, and I've got some parameters here. So the parameter alpha is a typical amplitude of the motion divided by the depth. So if alpha is a tenth, it means the waves are one-tenth of the depth. Okay, beta is the depth divided by a typical wavelength. And um, so if beta is a tenth, then a typical wavelength is 10 times the depth. So long waves, small amplitude is what you're thinking about. These are not unrelated. Well, okay, you can make a decision about alpha and beta. You can, and what the, your decision about alpha and beta says what kind of waves are you modeling? If you want to model the whole set of waves, you get to the Euler equation. We'll talk about those in a minute. Those are pretty recalcitrant. It's very hard to say much about them, even now. Okay, so there's a number S. S stands for Stokes. You've heard of Stokes. Alpha upon beta squared. That's A lambda squared over H naught cubed. And that, so the, the regime we're talking about is alpha small, beta small compared to one and S of order one. So that's a balance between alpha and beta squared. This is, this is called the Boussinesque regime because Boussinesque, let's write him down. You probably don't know Boussinesque. Boussinesque was a uh, Frenchman. He was, um, teaching in high school and uh, gymnasium, and he was discovered by a major mathematician um, at some point. And 10 years later, he was a member of the French Academy. This guy was absolutely brilliant. I mean, he was decades ahead of his time, if you read his work carefully. Okay, so here are the, the what, what, what engineers call the full equations of motion. They are not the full equations of motion. You're leaving out all sorts of effects here. But they sort of look like a full equation. So let's study this for a minute. Notice that I've scaled all the variables in sight. So the, ver the horizontal variables, x and y, are scaled by the wavelength, this wavelength parameter. And the vertical is scaled by the depth. So horizontal and vertical are not scaled the same way. As a consequence, the top line there is Laplace's equation, but because of the different scaling in x, y, and z, there's a beta squared that comes out in front of the Laplacian. The Laplacian is a two-dimensional Laplacian. Okay, at the bottom, the bottom is, okay, so what are the variables here? So we have two variables. We have, so I'm gonna draw this two-dimensionally. So here's a bottom. There's the undisturbed free surface. This is H naught. And here's the wave. So the crucial variable is this one. So X tells you where you are along the propagation. And H of X and T is this height. Now H is not small. So you're looking, for, and you're looking for something that's small because you want to make some kind of approximation. So what you do is you subtract the undisturbed depth 
and you call that eta. Okay, eta could be small. That's, that's my parameter alpha. Alpha was the amplitude divided by the depth. So eta could be small. H is not small. So eta is one of the variables. And you see that here and there. Um, the other variable, phi, is the velocity potential. Okay, so there is a velocity potential. That's a theorem that's more or less due to Stokes. That means that the gradient of phi is the velocity field. There are two horizontal velocities and the vertical velocity. And that the second condition is a boundary condition at the bottom. Remember, the bottom is flat here. And so it says d phi dz is 0. d phi dz is the vertical velocity. So it just says that the water doesn't go through the bottom. And by the way, it doesn't come up from the bottom either. That's all it says. OK. So those two are linear, and they're very simple. They, they, don't, they don't look scary at all. Where is the water wave problem? Here it is. These are boundary conditions, time-dependent boundary conditions, at the free surface. And you don't know where the free surface is. That's why you have two boundary conditions. It's Laplacian. You'd only need one. But you don't know where the free surface is. It's part of the solution. So because you don't know where the free surface is, you get this rather complicated system of equations. So this is a, this is a, a, a problem that was known in the 19th century. The amount of progress we've made on this is minuscule. <laughs> And we're now 150 years later. So these, this is hard. So early on, people decided we need to make models that are simpler than what, we, what you see in front of you. So the first thing we did is, OK, these, this is a coast of Australia again. Um, let's see. Let, this is a close-up of those waves. These are what are called long-crested waves. So notice they have these long crests. They're propagating this way. There's not much action in the y direction. Everything is in the x direction. So maybe you're justified, going back to the Euler equation, maybe you're justified in setting d by dy is equal to 0. And um, ignoring the y dependence of the solution. So if you do that, you get the two-dimensional Euler equation, which look a little simpler. OK, but still not very simple. OK, and at this level, you can now make expansions using the fact that alpha and beta are small. OK, so, oops. OK, I, I won't go through this. But these are the kind of equations that you get. You get couple system of pairs of equations. And what you'd like to know is first, well, you'd like to know a lot of things. First, you'd like to know if this has solutions, if you pose initial data. And secondly, you'd like to know, does it approximate that full set of Euler type equations, this thing? And the answer to both of those questions is yes. And actually, we have theory now, this theory is recent, that these equations actually work. OK, so here's a criteria that you might want to use for deciding whether these models are any good. Are they well posed, linearly, nonlinearly, locally, globally? Do they preserve energy? Because the full Euler equations preserve energy. And not all of them do, actually. Some of them do not preserve energy. There's a whole three-parameter family of these models. If they don't, that's great. You throw them out. Do it, does it have solitary waves? Well, I won't talk about those. You'd like a theorem that compares them with the full equations. There is such a theorem. And you'd like laboratory experiments. So I'm going to show you laboratory experiments, and then we'll go back to our problems. So I'm, this gets a little technical, so I'm skipping it. Actually, it gets quite a bit technical. OK, here's some experiments that show you that we're not talking, we're talking about the real thing. 
Okay, so this is a, this is a tank. It's 15 meters long, roughly. Um, the there's an experiment I'm going to show you. The experiment runs like this. Okay, so I have a wave maker at one end of the channel, and here's the undisturbed surface. And at time zero, I turn the wave maker on. Okay, so I have two things under my control. I have the amplitude of that motion, and I have the frequency. And the frequency is controlled by what's called a stepping motor, so it's good to 10 to the minus 6 hertz. Very accurate. The amplitude is not that, that good, but it's pretty good. The amplitude here translates into the, the parameter alpha. And the frequency of the wave maker translates into lambda. So I have control of lambda and alpha. Okay, and the experiment is as following. I start at time zero. I turn on the wave maker. At time zero, everything's at rest. So I do not have to measure the free surface. It's zero. And th then we start getting waves. And um, we take measurements. So in the particular experiments I'm going to show you, I, I took four. Let's see if I think I have a cartoon of that. Yeah. Okay, so here's what I'm trying to show you. So I'm taking four measurements down the channel. I'm actually not touching the water. I'm measuring the capacitance between the surface and that little transistor, trans not transistor, that plate of, of that. And that response is fast enough for water waves. So what, what am I going to measure? I'm going to measure here. This is a fixed x. Right, I'm not varying x, it's time that's varying. And, and then I'm going to measure three more of them. Now I need some initial data. Well, actually it's not initial data, boundary data. So at this point, which I'll call x equals zero, I measure the, 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 the signal. Let me show you what it looks like. This is what it looks like. So it looks, doesn't look very fierce. It looks more or less like a sine wave. It's not a sine wave, but it looks a lot like a sine wave. I'm putting that into an initial boundary value problem. So, okay, x equals zero is here. So what I'm measuring, what, I, what I'm showing you there, and I stick it up like that because I want you to remember it's a time signal. It's not a spatial signal. Okay, so this is going into an initial boundary value problem. You have some mo model equation here. It's not important. It's one of the ones that I skipped when I was going through the water wave stuff. So, okay, and I'll solve that problem, and then I'll look at x1, x2, and x3. That's what my model predicts, and I'll compare it with what I measure. Okay, so this is a very direct comparison. There are no free parameters here. Okay, so here's a comparison where this so-called Stokes number is of order four, which is right where that should, this model should be working. And by the way, it does appear to work pretty well. You can see um, uh, the first station, the, the wave has come on board, and the, the diamonds are the measurements. And the line is the piecewise linear interpolation of the output of the numerical scheme. So it seems to work pretty well. Your problem is, you'd say, that's a pretty simple wave. But it's not as simple as you think. This is what the computer thinks is in the channel. So these are spatial traces at different times. And the comparisons were with, with the temporal trace of those spatial traces. Okay. okay, now that's Stokes number four is not so interesting to engineers, but Stokes number 25 is. The, the waves are not too far from breaking. And okay, it's the same experiment. The, the boundary data doesn't look any different. But you can see that um, already a secondary crest has formed at the first measuring station down the, down the channel. Um, that secondary crest is under the primary crest at this stage. And here you can see the secondary crest coming out, propagating at the wrong speed. You can see the model beginning to break down. 
my engineering friend said, this is fantastic. <laughs> they, they thought this was spot on. I mean, you can, you can adjust the model slightly if you want to fix this, this little problem. OK. OK, and here's what's in the channel. This is what the computer thinks is in the channel. So th it's those traces, those temporal traces, that generated these comparisons. Th that's not a very simple looking wave. OK, so one got some confidence that these things have predictive power. OK, uh, let's go back to rogue waves. Um, remember the question, where do they come from? OK, so let's. Let's talk about this concurrence business. The concurrence was, business was you had energy all over the ocean, and it got together and made a big wave. But it came back apart, and you no longer had a big wave. So that, that was the idea. When I started this project, my goal was to show you could not have concurrence. I, I figured that just wasn't going to happen. All right, so follow me along. So, Linear theory, let's forget nonlinear effects for a minute and just talk about linear theory. And for those who know something about this, the linear theory is that top line there. That's the linear Cordvig de Vries equation, never mind who Cordvig and de Vries were. That's a problem you can solve by taking the Fourier transform in the spatial variable. K is the dual variable to x. And you get that second line which is just an ordinary differential equation for each fixed k. You can write the solution down. There it is. And then you can take the inverse Fourier transform, and you will get a solution, and there it is. OK, so this requires a little bit of special functions knowledge, but not much. OK, so ai is the Airy function. Airy was the astronomer royal in England in the 1840s, a famous guy. Uh, and it's a convolution, but there's this factor of t to the third in the, okay, and there's an initial data. Okay, so that's the solution. Now, what about this Airy function? I mean, that's the key to, to, to the solution there. The, the Airy function looks like this. It's, there's Airy's equation that did not come up in waterways for Airy. It came up in his study of optics, okay, and it has two it's a second order equation, it has two linearly independent solutions. And actually, there's only one of them that's bounded, so that's the one we care about. And that's the one in red. The green one is, is the other one, and it's, it's not bounded. So the one we care about is the one in red. So notice that it looks like it decays super exponentially near plus infinity. Near minus infinity, it looks like it's going down pretty slowly and oscillating. And actually, that's correct. Here's this asymptotic situation. So as it goes to plus infinity, it looks like x to the minus x cubed. OK, so it is super linearly going down. Um, x3 halves, sorry. Near, near plus infinity, well, near minus infinity, because I've got a minus x here, it still decays like x to the 1 8th or something like that, um, but it oscillates fiercely. And as x gets larger and larger, the oscillation gets more and more fierce. Okay, So it's, it's not an integrable function. It's not L1, it's not L2, it's L something, L4, L5, or something like that. Um, but it has an improper Riemann integral, and you normalize it by asking for that to be 1. The reason it has an improper integral is because of the oscillation can cancellation. The thing cancels like crazy. OK. So the solution of the initial value problem looks like this. The Airy function convolved with the initial data. OK, now where are you going to get concurrence? That's the question. So the answer is. Well, you have what's called a dispersion relation. If you stick into the linear Cordvig de Vries equation a plane wave, e to the i k x minus c t, you will discover that, that for that to be a solution, 
c, the phase speed, has to be 1 minus k squared. Okay. Just algebra. So here, here's, here's a graph of that 1 minus k squared. And notice that, so k is a wave number. So it's inversely proportional to the wave length. So k small means long waves. k large means short waves. So notice that what, what this relation is telling us, it says that the long waves propagate to the right, the right, and the short waves propagate to the left. They go backwards. So here's a place where you could get concurrence. You could imagine, maybe I put a picture here. Yeah, here. You can imagine organizing initial data which had a bunch of short waves out near plus infinity. And you organize those things so that they go, they're going backwards, remember? They go backwards, but they go at different speeds. And if you organize it just right, maybe you can get them all to come crashing together and you fi might find uh, some, some blow up of some sort. Okay, so is that possible? I was trying to show not. Okay, well, where would I get a function with short waves near plus infinity? Well, the answer is to turn every function around. Put those oscillations near plus infinity and put the super exponential decay at minus infinity. Okay, that wouldn't be a finite energy solution, so I might need to normalize it to make it with finite energy. Okay, suppose I put that in as initial data. Then here's the solution. Okay. All right, and that looks good because near, near, near minus infinity, when y is near minus infinity, both of these things are decaying super exponentially. There's no problem with convergence, none, zero. Uh, near, near, near plus infinity, okay, I don't have, so, have these things going down rapidly, but I do have a weight here, which will help. And I've got oscillations, and they're out of tune because of the t to the one-third. They're not tuned. So they cancel each other out. This function is a smooth C infinity function most of the place, most of the time. When is it not? When is it not is when t goes to one and x is zero. Because when that happens, there's no more cancellation. This is just ai at minus y squared. Okay, so then you have to do a little arithmetic to see that what I just said is correct. And you can show that sure enough, if you choose that m, remember the m was this normalization. If I choose the m between an eighth and a quarter, you have finite energy solutions that blow up at zero one. Okay, so maybe that's a rogue wave. Okay, you're gonna say, come on guy, <laughs> that's linear. The nonlinear stuff is going to kill that off. You know, as soon as you get any, anywhere big, the nonlinear stuff will take effect, and um, all this is going to be junk. And actually, and this, was, this was the surprise for me, um, you can put the nonlinear stuff in. Here it is. This is a de Hamel formula. And um, I won't go into this, but you get a new, it's not a solution. It's a relationship <laughs> between eta and eta. But and I've missed an integral from minus infinity to infinity here. This is a double integral. This is that linear problem we just analyzed. And this is a double integral. And it turns out that's under control. So the, this is unusual. The linear part blows up, and the nonlinear part is under control. OK, so maybe concurrence does work. OK, then you can keep making objections, and we keep finding ways to counter those objections, you, you can um, say, OK, you need a two-way model, not a one-way model. OK, that also has this same property. It's much, much harder. And then you can go to the fully three-dimensional Boussinesq system, and that also has this property. OK, so maybe concurrence is a, is a route to rogue waves. OK, let me, OK, the blood flow, OK. Uh, Okay, let me just say a word about this. If you, if you look at an at a artery, a piece of the artery, it's, it's elastic. And the heart beats, it pumps fluid, and it expands. And that's the wave. That's the spring. 
if you, if, to, if you have waves, you've got to find a spring. It has to be a spring somewhere. The spring here is this elastic response. And if you, okay, so here comes Young's modulus and the Poisson ratio and the wall motion. This is linear theory. This is, this is an equation for the motion of the wall, and that's what I'm going to model. Okay, but you notice that there are parameters here. There's a Poisson ratio, there's a Young modulus and stuff. For this model to be helpful, I have to be able to find out what those are. And it turns out we can. Um, okay, so the experiment um, is with, with rats, a certain particular type of rat. Um, the experiment goes on for several weeks. Now you'll see what we do. But what I'm showing you here is the measuring devices that determine things like the Poisson ratio and, and so forth. Okay, so here's the experiment. Uh, the mouse, by the way, is, uh, is definitely unconscious. This is, this is the heart. Um, we have measuring devices in the heart. We can measure both the flow and the pressure simultaneously. And we can induce uh, this, um, oops, sorry, induce the disease by clamping the aorta. So we clamp the aorta, not closed, but enough so that we're, we're, we're generating um, the sort of thing that ha actually happens in practice. And again, we can measure everything in sight. Okay, conservation of mass and momentum. There they are, very simple. Okay, I, I'm gonna write them, A is the, is the cross-sectional area, but I'm gonna write it in terms of the radius. And this is what I get. And then I need to put in that wall motion. So here, here was the wall motion. And I get this couple pair of equations, which, by the way, is the original set of equations that Boussinesq wrote down in 1877. <laughs> um, and it's, by the way, ill-posed. He didn't know anything about ill-posed. Okay, but you can make it well posed, very simple correction. All right, so let me show you. Okay, this, uh, this again is the arterial system, mathematician's version. I'm gonna, the heart is up there pumping, I, I will specify that. And then I need to measure what happens at the various nodes. And down at the bottom, of course, I'm near zero pressure. Okay, so this is, these are actual measurements, real, real live measurements of a living creature, not a human. Uh, this is the ascending aorta, the arch, the descending aorta, et cetera. And there, you see the pressure going up. Uh, that's what happens because they get smaller. The arteries get smaller. The flow rate goes down, of course. So the question is, can we predict that? Okay, so here, okay, I'm showing you a picture. Here's the aorta, the arch, the descending aorta. The, okay, there's more that happens down here. After a while, it gets small and you can't, you can't measure it anymore. So these are the pressure in the numerical simulation of a nine-edged tree. Okay, look at those for a second. And then let's go back to this picture. And you'll see actually quite a good agreement. I was astounded. <laughs> My bioengineering friends said, of course. Okay, so this thing, this model has some predictive power. Uh, it's being used in ongoing experiments to try to understand uh, this, prop, this, this problem. Okay, I'll finish quickly with sandbar formation and beach protection. Um, and I, I've introduced beach protection. I didn't tell you about that before. But you kind of saw it. Because remember the picture where I showed you, the first picture where I showed you what I said were three bars. And the last bar, the waves were breaking. So if you have a beach with bars on it, the wave will break over that last bar. It may break over the second one even. And it'll lose energy. And by the time it gets to the beach, you're less likely to have your beach washed out. Okay. So, okay, we did a bunch of experiments. I'm going to have to skip this. And some modeling. 
OK, this, this is interesting. Uh, this is the Outer Banks. This is Kitty Hawk, where the Wright brothers flew their airplane. This is Duck, North Carolina. <laughs> You've never heard of Duck. Uh, it's a little village as you ride along the Outer Bank. But the US Army Corps of Engineers spent 20 years at Duck measuring everything in sight. And one thing they measured was the sandbars. There were sandbars. So here you see a measurement where, where OK, let's go back a second. There's a pier here. It's a research pier. You're, you're launching. A, a, boats from these piers. You're putting arrays of instruments in the water. Every once in a while, a few, few more million dollars comes from Washington, and you do new arrays. So <laughs> that's all right. Um, they're not wasting their money. So our data is taken from this stretch of the measuring field. And the reason for this one is it's the farthest from the, from, from the pier. OK, so th this is. I don't know, $20, $30 million worth of data that you're looking at. And it just looks like a cloud of data. <laughs> it doesn't look like anything. It's, it's what's called an equilibrium beach profile. And in fact, we have theory that does pretty well with that. But I don't care about that. Let me show you. Here in 81, you see a single bar. And that was something that happened quite frequently at various times in the 20 years. You had a single bar located at about 220 meters in their local coordinate system. OK? OK, this is 1983. You had two bars. And that also was a frequent uh, happenstance. Two bars, various times in the 20 years. So the question is, what's happening? In the summer, when you're there, dipping yourself into the ocean, nothing is happening. The, the bottom is not moving. There's, the waves are not big enough. But in the winter, storms come, typically three to five storms. Those storms are different. They generate big waves, very long wavelength. The longer the wavelength, the deeper the water goes in motion, and the more you can move the sediment around. OK, so we looked for and found in the data a transition. So in January of 89 and February of 89, you had one bar. And in March, you had two. So the question is, what happened? OK, and this is what, <laughs> this is what you get to play with. Um, I want to call your attention to the wave height um, because it's, yeah, yeah, here we go. Um, it's the square of this that's important. And here you had a big storm coming through. And OK, so let me get a little ahead of myself. Yeah, here, here, here you can see it better. That storm changed the wave parameters. So you had parameters that fit with the single sandbar. And then all of a sudden, you had different parameters in our little model. And, and OK, here's the wave period. What this, again, this is the sort of data you So we started off, we did a numerical simulation, starting off at, this is a two-day simulation, starting off at time zero with a single bar. And then we turned on the storm. Turning on the storm just means you you change the parameters. And you see that the model goes smoothly over to a two-bar configuration. And those two bars were amazingly more or less where we saw them. Again, I was flabbergasted. My engineers said, of course. OK, so I'm going to skip this because I want to get to the part where we actually use this model. OK, so this is the Gold Coast of, of Australia. Um, that's, those are expensive condominiums in the background, you know, two or three million dollars a throw. And this is a beach which I gather was, once upon a time, a big, nice beach. Maybe it wasn't Rio, but it wasn't bad. And uh, they don't have a beach. So they got a coastal engineer to come in. He actually he was very good. He measured everything in sight. And he happened to catch the lecture of one of my collaborators on this project in Sydney. 
And so she was talking about our model for sandbar formation and movement. And he said, oh, come up to my Gold Coast and have a look. She's not stupid. Somebody invites her to the Gold Coast and says, I'll pay the bill. <laughs> she went. Uh, well, her remark, I remember her telling me, uh, was, <laughs> you don't have a beach. <laughs> but she didn't know what to do about it. OK. OK, I'm a little ahead of myself. Let me finish this. So she got data from the coastal engineer on, that he had measured uh, on everything in sight. And she went back home to Quebec and um, ran our model with that data. And the model said that there should have been a great huge sandbar about 150, 200 meters deep at, further out, out from the beach. OK, put that in your hat for a minute. In the meantime, the coastal engineer, he's not a mathematician. He has a timeline. These people that are paying the bill want some results. So he gave them options. Uh, and one option was to put some kind of breakwater out there in the middle. The trouble with that option is it might work. If it doesn't work, you'll never get rid of that breakwater. It's there forever. So what they went with was the cheapest option, which was beach nourishment. You could be a coastal engineer, too. What is beach nourishment? Beach nourishment is you pour sand where you want a beach. You bring in truckloads of sand, and you make a beach. And I gather this is like the beach was before they lost it. So it's, as I say, it's not Rio, but it's not bad. Not a bad beach. I mean, you can get the idea of the size by the vehicle there. OK, now the trouble with this was that it went away. Actually, in one season, it went away. So that didn't seem very palatable to the burgers, the local burgers, because they didn't want to have to nourish their beach every year. That's expensive, and it's, you can't use the beach while it's being nourished. So my collaborator said to, to the coastal engineer, look, why don't you throw sand into the water where you th we think there should be a sandbar? Let the bar form. The waves will do it for you. And once it's formed, you can nourish your beach, and it won't go away. <laughs> Would you buy that? <laughs> I mean, you're talking about three quarters of a million dollars. <laughs> so oh. So in fact, they did buy it. So you, you see this large uh, boat dredging up sand and putting in this small boat that can come near the shore. There, the small boat, not so small, the small boat is pouring sand into the water. It's like w w watching money run out of your bank account. <laughs> but it, it seemed to work. A bar did form. And OK, the coastal engineer r r renewed the beach. And a couple of years later, they fired him because the beach stayed. <laughs> <laughs> OK, I apologize for going on. And um, thank you very much for your attention.